very relevant topic. It's a topic that is interesting. It exists, but at the same time, it doesn't really exist. Um, it's known, but at the same time, it's unknown. So the focus of our webinar today will be on EU standards and regulations for furniture. So we will be talking about the EU rules enshrined in the European General Product Safety Directive. Before we start, I would like to make some technical announcements. First of all, pay attention to the fact that we are going to record our event today. It's important for us to produce a recording because we want to make it available to have it cannot participate today. If you do not want to be recorded or if you have any objections against recording, just have your camera off. And the second technical announcement pertains to simultaneous interpretation. We have been using Zoom for a long time, so I'm sure you are familiar with the interpretation function. But if we have some new participants here, I will make this announcement anyway. So please find a globe symbol at the bottom of the Zoom screen, click on this globe and pick the Ukrainian channel. Just pick this channel once and stay there, and then you will hear everything in Ukrainian. Our main working language today will be English, but we're going to have simultaneous interpretation into Ukrainian. So you will be able to hear Ukrainian at all times. If you encounter any technical issues or for whatever reason, you cannot hear the Ukrainian interpretation, please write about it in the chat and we will provide you with guidance. If you cannot access the Ukrainian channel, most likely you don't have the latest version of Zoom. And so what you need to do, you need to disconnect, go to the Zoom website, download the latest version of Zoom, and then you will be able to access the Ukrainian channel. My name is Radmila Ustich. I represent the Forza NGO. We are going to have trainers from the Bern University of Applied Sciences. I will introduce them to you in several minutes. But now I would like to give the floor to one person that will provide you with an overview of the background behind this project. So it's a great pleasure for me to give the floor to Pavlo Ladetsky, who represents the UNIDO project. And this webinar is possible thanks to the UNIDO project. Uh, thank you, Radmila. Uh, good morning, uh, participants. Uh, this is the final webinar within this project uh, this year. My name is uh, Pavlo Ladetsky. Uh, I am an expert within the UNIDU project. The title of the project is uh, Implementation of the Expert Potential of the Wood Processing Industry of Ukraine uh, by Strengthening the Quality Infrastructure. This project is being implemented within the Global Quality and Standards Program, GQSP. You can see this abbreviation on the slide. Similar projects are implemented within this program um, in um, upwards of uh, 60 uh, countries in South America, um, Africa and Asia, um, Georgia, Kyrgyzstan, Ukraine and Albania are the new countries that joined recently. Approaches are very similar, but products vary. In Ukraine, we decided to focus on uh, wooden um, windows and furniture. The Bern University of Applied Sciences and Forza uh, conducted an in-depth preliminary analysis. We are very grateful to them. We also had meetings with the furniture associations and other stakeholders. And together we decided to place emphasis on these 
types of products. Um, briefly about the project, the purpose is to build a system with uh, a good supply and demand um, mechanism grounded in the quality infrastructure. So we're talking about certification, testing, accreditation, a wide array of activities and measures. But within our project, we want to uh, facilitate the formation of supply. We want to strengthen the quality infrastructure. We want um, to have a standardization body in Ukraine that will understand the needs of the market players. Uh, we will also focus on accreditation. Uh, we want all the products to be accredited. We want the testing labs to be fully equipped. And the second component of our project pertains to demand. Uh, this webinar today is taking place uh, thanks to Forza NGO and the Bern University of Applied Sciences. And we would like to link these two sides, uh, supply and uh, demand. Well, I really hope that uh, after this information, you will not fall off the chair like you can see in the photograph. We receive a lot of questions from business representatives. What are the European regulations? What are the regulations and rules in Germany, for example? And we understand that the situation is quite challenging. As for Windows, the situation is a little bit different because this market is regulated. Windows are part of construction products. We already have labs and other stakeholders on the market. As for furniture, the situation is more difficult because this market is not completely regulated. And we don't really have a good system of standards and regulations in place. And the focus today will be on technical aspects, a certificate and standards. So you will be exposed to voluminous information about how it works in the EU. Within our project, we will continue this work. We want to uh, provide technical and economic support. Uh, we want to identify a lab in Ukraine that will provide support services within such issues as uh, tendering, uh, testing, etc. I also want to point out uh, that the project is working um, on a brochure and uh, some other promotion materials. Uh, we have uh, a separate expert uh, to this end. He might join um, a little bit later. And uh, this document, uh, we believe, will be helpful for you. Uh, we will um, also have the um, expert office representatives today. It's a public institution that contributes to expert development in Ukraine. And they already have good cooperation with the furniture market representatives. So we really hope uh, that we will be able to improve the situation in the near future. That's it in terms of the background information on our project. This webinar is not a one-off event. It's part and parcel of an entire series of events that we are going to have within the project. Should you have any questions, you can text me in the chat or I will provide you with my contacts and you can address me whenever there is a need or a question. I freely hope that you, as the participants of this webinar, will be able to hear information today that will help you develop and grow, and that will be to the benefit of Ukraine and the entire globe. Thank you, and let's um, step on this pathway towards new learning and knowledge. Well, thank you very much, Pablo. Uh, let me reiterate that if you have any questions um, after the workshop, maybe you have some questions on standardization, uh, certification, 
um, how furniture can be standardized and certified on the EU markets, you can contact uh, Pavlo Ladetsky, a representative of the UNIDU project, but you can also uh, forward your questions to the Forza office. This is the um, Ukrainian implementing partner. You can also forward your questions to the Ukrainian Furniture Manufacturers Association. They um, are not really a partner within the project, but they are our big friend. And I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to this association for their support and assistance with the organization of the webinar. Right now on the screen, you can see our agenda for today. You can see the key points that we will be talking about. You will be exposed to multiple case studies. We really hope that through this webinar, you will get to dive deeper into the consequences that manufacturers and suppliers might be subjected to if they do not comply with the relevant regulations. We will be working for about three hours until 2 p.m. Um, Kyiv time. We will also have a, a um, short break somewhere in, in the middle of our meeting. And we will also have uh, um, representatives uh, of the Office for Entrepreneurship and Expert Development. Um, they will provide us with some info on the available tools on the required standards and certificates. And a couple of words about our today's trainers. The material for today was put together by the representative of the Center for Excellence for um, Windows, Doors, and Facades. It's a test laboratory from the Bern University of Applied Sciences in Switzerland. Um, our main violin today will be Urs Ullinger. You can see him in the photograph, my name is Radmila Ustic. I represent the Forza NGO um, agency uh, for uh, facilitate, facilitating development in the Carpathian region. We are based in Ushorod. We are the Ukrainian implementing partner. We've been operating since 2009. We specialize in activities for foresters. We help them introduce uh, sustainable forest management practices. We also cooperate with municipalities and support them in developing mobility and cycling infrastructure. And we also do a lot of work with the online training programs for furniture manufacturers, for students. So we help design um, curricula and training programs on such issues as digital transformation, digitization, and innovation management. It's a great pleasure for me to see all of you and we would like to know more about who you are and what you do. So I have a request to all of you, please write in the chat um, your name, uh, the organization that you represent and the city where you live. And now I want to give the floor to Urs. Thank you, Radmila, uh, for this uh, introduction. Uh, also, my greetings from Switzerland. Uh, we just uh, face a bit colder weather now. Snow is coming close. Um, I'm quite uh, delighted to have this uh, presentation today. I hope it meets your uh, expectations. Um, also, thank you to UNIDO to give us uh, this opportunity to uh, collaborate uh, with the Ukrainian industry and the test labs. So maybe just a quick word. Uh, the Bern University of Applied Science runs an accredited test lab uh, since 2001, so it'll be just around 20 years for construction products and furniture and also chemistry, which is re mainly related to wood and wood products. So um, you heard already the content of uh, this presentation for today. So. I just have to go for myself to get the right screen 
for me. I need my English version, otherwise it will be difficult. <laughs> While Urs is setting up the English language presentation, um, I want to also introduce my colleagues, Ms. Irina Shchoka. You should know her because you um, must have been in contact uh, with her over the phone. Uh, our technical support is Kirill Loiko and our favorite interpreter, Olha interpreter. Um, owing to her, um, you will not really feel any discomfort in terms of uh, language and interpretation. If you have just joined, just a reminder that if you want to listen to the Ukrainian interpretation, please find a globe symbol, click um, on it and find the Ukrainian channel. And now I will get muted and want to give the floor back to Urs. Oh, thank you, Rosmila. Um, okay, so uh, let's start uh, with the legal issues. This is the first uh, uh, subject we are going uh, to look at uh, with two or three case studies. Uh, then we go uh, further to client, client requirements. There we have a look at the market surveillance in Ukraine and Switzerland. How does it work and how it functions and how it works in reality. Then the third part, we will have a look on standards and certification. And there, uh, it's also interesting to see uh, how uh, the standards are applied in the uh, test laboratory. And at the end, we will have a look on trends in the furniture uh, business or furniture industry. Um, we will see where we'll, we'll have the break. Uh, we will just go on with the first part now. And uh, Radmila will interrupt if uh, it gets too long or uh, we have a problem with the time. So um, legal issues, we go for a case study. Next slide, please. Uh, here you see uh, three typical furniture. One is uh, uh, this uh, change table for a change furniture for the kids. Uh, then is one. Then there are two chairs. One is a folding chair, and the second one is a chair in restaurants. There are three actual cases I would like to look at. Next slide, please. So let's see the first uh, case. It is a baby changing table uh, with uh, apparently some problems because IKEA. It's a IKEA uh, furniture. Uh, as you know, IKEA is uh, operating worldwide. And uh, so they had to call back this changing table uh, due to risk of injury. There were three incidents apparently where this fold out part, you see it on the left, uh, this fold out part came loose and three children fell off the table. And uh, it turned out that the security fittings, which were uh, also delivered with the furniture, were not used according to the instruction. So uh, IKEA had to, to uh, change the manual, had to change also the furniture to get it right, to get this furniture safe. Um, what is interesting on it, uh, IKEA is very progressive in calling back uh, any furniture or any product which may have a risk of injury or may have a risk for any persons. So they do it themselves. Uh, you see two links on the right. Uh, one is from uh, IKEA uh, itself. And the other one is uh, one of the European uh, website uh, where there is also the uh, the same text actually, but also on the European level, uh, they did something. Next slide, please. <laughs> so the second uh, case uh, is also a very interesting one. It came up uh, in Switzerland. Uh, we had it in our test laboratory. So what happened is that the person lost it, uh, one of its, uh, uh, its fingers when this garden chair collapsed when uh, 
they were sitting on it. So accidentally, uh, the chair folded. It is a folding chair, but it shouldn't fold when you're sitting on it. Uh, so the question, uh, we, questions which were raised was, was it unintentional folding? Is it uh, possible? Have, do we have any shear or crush points, uh, which may be dangerous for hands or fingers? Uh, and then of course, uh, does this product comply with security requirements? So uh, next slide, please. So after this investigation at the test lab, it was really clear that this chair can suddenly collapse and unintentionally. We even had the case that one of our testers almost uh, uh, had a, a problem with his fingers because the chair really collapsed uh, unintentionally. Um, it was uh, visible that this, uh, Foldy mechanism, it was not possible, or, or sometimes it was possible that uh, it, it was not completely uh, open, so uh, it was not completely safe. And you see on the pictures these shear and crush points, and they were also classified as dangerous. And this test can be done uh, by uh, uh, by using the, the uh, European test standard. So what also turned out uh, was that this product didn't have any test certificate according to a currently valid standard. So finally, uh, next slide, please. You see here once more uh, a bit close of what, uh, uh, how that works with this uh, chair that this Folding mechanism can go unnoticed uh, by the user uh, because uh, this little part, which is uh, marked, uh, didn't uh, engage properly. So, next slide, please. Uh, no, sorry, let's go back to this one. Sorry, uh, yeah, we stay on this one. Um, what happened? Uh, this uh, company, or it was actually the retailer, it was a big uh, uh, chain, retailer chain in Switzerland, had to call back this chair and of course uh, took it off uh, its shops. Next slide, please. Here we have a third case, a restaurant chair. So compared with the chair, what we saw before, here we are in the public space. Uh, public space is uh, also more difficult. The requirements are higher because here you don't know exactly uh, who is using these chairs. If you are in the private, on the private level, uh, domestic use, uh, as we saw the chair before, the requirements are not that high. But uh, this chair was uh, situated in, in a restaurant. And what happened? Uh, a guest in the restaurant fell off uh, the chair or he fell to the floor because the chair broke. And uh, he had, a, out of this accident, he had a permanent health restriction. Uh, he uh, in, was injured at the back. So that here, the question was, what was the cause of this breakage? You see in the middle of the picture uh, where uh, you see also these cracks, um, which were visible. And on the right, on the top right, you see the chair, which were uh, secured for investigation from the restaurant. Next slide, please. So what we did in the test laboratory, we took two more uh, uh, similar chairs or same chairs from the same uh, production uh, and we tested it to the relevant EN standard. And the result was really uh, surprisingly that both chairs which we tested broke in the same way. You see on the bottom, uh, these two pictures, uh, we had exactly the same uh, problem as on the 
on the broken chair which uh, uh, was involved in the accident. So here, uh, next slide please. Here we would like to, or I would like to go a bit deeper into uh, this uh, case because the questions related to the claim uh, from the inspection agency uh, could an accident could have could it have been uh, avoided if the chair had been tested? That was one question. The second question is from the restaurant owner: uh, What do we have to do? Does he have to replace all chairs, or what are the measures he has to take to uh, avoid? Uh, any other accidents or future accidents and what is the long-term measure check all chairs by a test center and then we also have uh, uh, this uh, product safety act what is the general product safety directive uh, to do in in this case so was it uh, observed uh, did someone had any look on it uh, related to this product? Next slide, please. So, as you can see, out of these uh, three furniture, it's not just the damage. Uh, in all three cases, we had injured persons, so it's quite severe and uh, of course, as soon as persons or injuries are involved, uh, insurance companies are involved and the costs are basically or usually quite high. Next slide, please. So let's have a look on the, uh, on the supply chain on this uh, uh, furniture chair. On the bottom you see uh, there is a designer of course, first there is a designer who designs the chair, who, who uh, develops a chair. And then you have a, a manufacturer who produces the chair. Here, in this stage, uh, there is the question, is there a testing laboratory uh, involved? Uh, it, maybe even during the designing of the chair or at latest when you go uh, for manufacturing. The testing laboratory usually can be involved in the, uh, uh, in the development. This is maybe a, a good way to, de to develop a new product, uh, to test it already on certain, uh, uh, for, for, for certain uh, uh, things which, which are important at the, at the chair. Or at late is the manufacturer when he goes into the production, the serial product, to test the serial product if it uh, complies with the latest uh, standards and requirements and uh, safety requirements main, mainly. And then it goes to the su supplier. You see this light blue uh, slider, supplier importer. He's also the distributor. He puts the product into the market. And here, of course, the distributor is, is the, the, the main actor who has to guarantee the safety of the product. And then we, in this case, with this restaurant chair, is a bit special. We had a restaurant owner who bought these uh, chairs for the restaurant, but he sold the whole restaurant a bit later. And so we have a second restaurant owner in this case which makes the whole thing a bit more complicated. Next slide, please. So what was the constellation of the claim? We have on top, we have this injured person. Then we have the restaurant owner, uh, the, the, the one who was at that moment, the restaurant owner. Then we had the rest the first restaurant owner and back down to the designer. Next step, please. So the injured person 
uh, was of course uh, he had an endurance, an accident endurance, and this uh, insurance company uh, paid, of course, first of all the the operation and all these uh, treatments, and uh, but then the insurance company try to uh, uh, get the costs back from someone else. And then there was the question, is it now the restaurant owner one? Is he the one who is responsible or is his restaurant owner two? Or is it the supplier importer or even the manufacturer? And uh, in this case, it is probably the supplier in port who is responsible because he didn't follow the general product safety directive. But of course, it is not that easy. It was it became a court case, and court cases are not always very clear. So uh, we don't know exactly what finally what happened. But uh, because it is, uh, or it was a quite difficult constellation with all these parties involved, uh, we, finally we didn't know what happened, but probably uh, it was rest that one of these three was responsible and had to pay for this case. Next slide, please. This leads to this uh, to the European General Product Safety Directive, which is already quite a while in operation in Europe. Um, and this is just to remind you once more, we had these slides already, uh, what the objective is, I want to go through quite quickly. Um, it is mainly to protect consumers from unsafe products. Next slide, please. So what's a safe product? And this is uh, also defined. It is under normal condition. It shouldn't present any risk or only minimum risk. And then uh, it also, the directive also writes that uh, safety evaluation must be performed uh, concerning the relevant products and you see here the list what is actually also uh, uh, written in words uh, and you, you also see that uh, children and elderly people are also uh, in focus. Next slide please. So the, directi the directive uh, also uh, says that the responsibility is uh, at the manufacturer, importer, uh, and importer to ensure the safety of the product. So the, it, the directive also writes that there must be uh, a risk assessment carried out, uh, if possible, or if necessary, testing according to standards, if there are any. And if there are none, uh, nevertheless, to follow, uh, follow up the state of the art, which can be uh, any uh, knowledge about accidents, uh, like uh, what we saw uh, in these accidents before with these chairs. Next slide, please. Yes, thank you. And then also what is uh, possible if the product is uh, might be unsafe, the European Commission can ban the marketing of it, recall it from customers or withdraw it from the market. And the member states uh, are entitled to, to do actually the same, the same and also uh, to request necessary information or take samples and even go for safety checks uh, if uh, they think uh, there might be a, a product, an unsafe product. Which products are within this directive? Here is a, again a quick overview. It means just any, all 
you see it is from cars, bicycles, uh, construction products, uh, consumer products, and also on the uh, on the right bottom you see a furniture. So it's actually all products are involved in this uh, general product safety directive. Next slide, please. And now we're going uh, a bit further because the directive provides also an alert system and to exchange this information about risks and also to exchange information about dangerous products and uh, gives also uh, some indication on, on uh, latest developments amongst uh, aspects for uh, the safety of products. And this alert system is called RAPEX, a Rapid Alert System for Dangerous Non-Food Products. Now we will have a look at this uh, system uh, with uh, a couple of samples. So it is a website from the European Union. You see here on the picture, it is weekly updated and you have the possibility, uh, you yourself uh, with these links uh, to search products, uh, by uh, different criteria, And uh, so I did it in the last uh, couple of uh, weeks. And next slide, please. One which I found is a furniture. Uh, it's a safety gate for children. And the, you see the risk description. I don't want to read it all. You can read yourself, but it is somehow unsafe. And then uh, you also see uh, the measured, the measures ordered by the public authorities, uh, the product had to be withdrawn from the market. And this is one thing, but the second thing, which is also quite costly, um, they had to recall the product from the end user just to prevent uh, any further accidents. Next slide, please. Another furniture, a bunk bed. You see, it looks quite nice with this uh, uh, car or double-decker uh, bus. Uh, it's a bed, but it is also uh, uh, quite risky because uh, there are possibilities that the, the, child, the children fall off. You see these open parts uh, at the top of the bus. Actually, there's also a bed on the top. Um, the, the, the children can fall off because the, the gaps are too, uh, too big and uh, the, the they can also get stuck in the holes. You don't see it uh, on this picture, but they can uh, get injuries or even can get uh, strangulated by uh, if, if the head is getting stuck somewhere in one of these holes. And here it was really written in this RAPEX that this product does not comply with this uh, relevant European standards, EN 747 one and two. And uh, also this product had to uh, be withdrawn uh, from the market. Next slide, please. Another furniture, also with children, a children high chair. And this children high chair, it looks quite nice. It looks quite safe, but apparently it's not safe. And especially with the high chairs, there is a oh, always a high risk of uh, tipping over uh, backwards, sidewards, um, because they are high and uh, you have to wait on top. So the tipping over is, is one of the high risks with uh, high chairs and the construction. If, if uh, the, you develop a chair, a high chair, you have to really to consider this, this uh, danger. So there is also an EN standard, this 14988, 
um, for high chairs. And in this case here, uh, also the product had to be withdrawn from the market and also had to be recalled from the end user, which is really uh, financial, can be, can lead to financial problems. So here you see once more the consequences, the possible consequences if there are failed products on the market. I don't want to read all this. Uh, you can read it yourself. Uh, I think it is quite clear. Next slide, please. <laughs> so if we talk about client requirements, we talk about uh, that the client requires a safe product. So how to find out uh, before it gets uh, uh, accidents? And now we'd like to, I'd like to have a look at the market surveillance in Ukraine, how that works, and uh, also in comparison with the uh, system in Switzerland, uh, you will see it's quite similar. Next slide, please, or thank you. Um, so this um, surveillance works actually on the domestic market. And in Ukraine, I've been told that there is an Ukrainian, Ukrainian law. Uh, this law is named General Safety and Non-Food Products. But for this is this law and there are no additional regulation on furniture in Ukraine. So nothing really special for furniture. So it's just uh, this general safety and non-food products. Next slide. So uh, this is really just for the domestic market and this market surveillance, there is a state service on food safety and consumer protection. Uh, you see also this, the, the website, it's, uh, you have it in Ukrainian, of course. Uh, so there is a state service uh, who does this market surveillance. Next slide, please. So what happened? So if there is a, a, a claim or if there is a, a case, uh, the state service uh, has got uh, several the territorial divisions and they conduct inspections on furniture. Uh, what is maybe a bit, uh, uh, what is maybe special is that they do only paper inspection. So they are not really uh, in, in they, are not, they have a problem to do all the technical things. So the technical part, so if there is a test, uh, needed, uh, they go with this product to an accredited lab and uh, it depends on the result uh, from case to case, they act if there is a, a non-conformity uh, visible. So this is how it apparently it works in Ukraine. Uh, I've been told that uh, on furniture, they are, the cases are fairly rare. Maybe the furniture are all safe in Ukraine or the people or, or the uh, surveillance is not uh, yet uh, really uh, functioning uh, very well. However, uh, let's have a look on Switzerland. We have actually the same. So we have a, a an inspection uh, agency. Uh, it's in German, this Beratungsstelle für Unfallverhütung. This is a private uh, agency and they are entitled by uh, the state uh, secretary for economic affairs, but they also do only paper. And also if they are able, they also some technical inspection. If they lack the expertise, they involve accredited labs and exactly in the same way as in Ukraine, they act in case of non 
conformity and they are entitled to withdraw the product from the market or even uh, recall the product from end user. Next slide, please. So how do they work? Uh, this uh, Beratungsstelle für Unfallverhütung, they define products with potential hazards. And this goes uh, due to accidents, uh, accident reports or statistics. And what they do is they go to the market, they, they buy different products in the market. So not that from the producer, basically. So they go to the shops and they buy the products. Then they do the inspection. If necessary, involve accredited labs and they act. And uh, the, what they try first is they try to uh, talk to manufacturers, importers, and uh, for implementing measures to improve the product. Uh, this may be the case if the product is uh, not that dangerous. If it is very dangerous, they also withdraw the product from the market or recall it from the end user. Next slide, please. So in the recent years, there were uh, these market surveys in Switzerland. Uh, they also did some on furniture. And you see always kids involved. So what they did in the last, uh, let's say, 15 years, 10 or 15 years, so they had a look on children cots. So they bought children cots on the market and uh, they were tested according to standards. Also the changing units, bunk beds was a, an issue, uh, safety gates for children, as you see exactly those uh, products which were also in this uh, RAPEX system and also children high chairs. So uh, we will have a look a bit later on on, uh, on uh, one of these products. Uh, but uh, first, I would like to maybe to open uh, questions on these cushions on it, because I talked already quite a while. And uh, maybe Rodmila. Uh, we go for questions if there are any. Uh, Otherwise, yeah. we can go go ahead again. Thank you, Urs. Dear participants, you've seen some examples and case studies. You've seen some examples of furniture that was not in line with the European safety regulations. You know now how market surveillance works in Switzerland and how it works or doesn't function in Ukraine. So we really hope that everything is clear. If not, please ask your questions. Maybe you have a similar experience or um, maybe you are familiar with this information or maybe uh, there was something new or something that came as a surprise. If there is a question or a comment that you would like to articulate, uh, please raise your hand virtually or you can just unmute yourself and start speaking. We've heard the perspective uh, of uh, test labs, clients, and inspection agencies. What about the manufacturers? Because I know that there are representatives of manufacturers. If there are no questions, we will continue. Uh, there is a question. Um, greetings. I understood the danger of that bunk bed, but for example, the auto company produces multiple bunk beds like that. So how do they 
undergo this certification, I mean, strangulation, or you don't really want a child to fall off the top of the bed. Is Switzerland an exception or it depends on the region? Because I know that there are some companies that produce bunk beds like this. I'm sure Switzerland is not uh, an, ex uh, an exception. <laughs> we follow the same rules as uh, in, in whole Europe. Um, it seems that I don't know exactly what the, the real problem with this bunk bed uh, in the picture was. I saw that there are several bunk beds like this around. Um, normally, the 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 problems are not really big, you know. If if you have uh, the the problem of strangulation, that means maybe uh, a gap is a couple of centimeters too wide or too small, or uh, the railing, the, the what is it called, the railing of of the bed on top is maybe a bit too uh, low by a couple of millimeters or by a couple of centimeters. Uh, it also depends on the mattress, which is uh, in this bed. Sometimes the wrong mattress is used. So the problem with, the, with these products are maybe not a basic big problem. It is just uh, they, the, the, the people or the, the, the people, the designer uh, didn't know about the uh, uh, the standard, because in the standard, they all all these measures are in, so it is fairly easy to follow a standard like the one from the bunk beds. But you have to read the standard before before you start with the development. If you're already in production, then it gets, of course, a bit more difficult because uh, during production, uh, improving a product which is already in production is is difficult. Does this uh, uh, somehow answer your question? Urs, I think she meant how come that, you know, these faulty bunk beds exist? How do they get certified if they exist on the market? Uh, Radmila ah. also wants to add ah, okay. that Urs will tell us more about the certification and testing process. Yes, but but nevertheless i would uh, i maybe i misunderstood this question sorry um it is not necessary to um for certification uh, you you don't need a certification for a bank bed this is maybe different to the production product regulation um you just have to uh, make sure that this product is safe and one of the possibilities is testing it according to a standard, but you are not uh, forced to test it to a standard. But if there is a, a, a safety problem, then of course, uh, uh, that uh, a test to uh, according to the standard uh, might help. But it is not necessary to go on the market to have it tested. Uh, thank you, Urs. Are there any other questions? If there are no other questions, then I suggest that we continue. Okay. So we go to a second part. Um, first, we go. Uh, uh, required standards and certificates. We have a look on, on uh, certificates for furniture in Germany. And then I would like to have a look uh, on the technical requirements for changing units, uh, because we also tested these uh, changing units for the market surveillance in Switzerland. So I can also show you a little bit how that works and what kind of tests we did. So next standard. So let's go for this uh, uh, example in Germany. So you may also know that the Germans or German customers, they have a, a strong affinity to quality and safety. So they like to have certificates uh, 
if I compare it with Switzerland, uh, it is much more uh, introduced that uh, all certificates, they ask for certificates all the time. Um, if we talk about uh, furniture in the non-domestic areas, uh, test certificates for furniture are necessary. You will not go, uh, you will not be able to sell products uh, on the market for educational institutions, offices, restaurants, etc. If you do not have uh, any uh, uh, certificates. So that means certificates means basically according to the uh, existing standards. Uh, another thing which is in Germany quite interesting, there are quality labels around. So they are also demand, demanded on the market and also widely accepted by the furniture industry. I will give you two examples uh, of uh, labels which are uh, important in Germany. Next slide. So first you have this GS sign. Uh, it's called tested safety in English or in German it's geprüfte Sicherheit. Uh, so this is also something which is uh, demanded by the German law and this is on sometimes even on top of the of the European standards so I will go a bit deeper into this and then you have this maybe as a, uh, another sample you have this RAL quality sign for furniture this golden M uh, this label is for furniture, which meet additionally defined requirements on top of EN standards. And this is mainly for domestic furniture. So the top one, the GS sign is mainly for uh, public areas or non-domestic. And the golden M is mainly for dom uh, domestic furniture. Next slide, please. So this Jf, uh, German safety mark, um, it is also internationally recognized. So you can find it even worldwide. This, although it is a German label, it's, uh, uh, it is also worldwide uh, accepted or known. It is a label we focus on safety, really safety in use. And uh, it is possible to certify different uh, products or, and in furniture is mainly children furniture, school furniture, office furniture. And there are also other uh, products, you know this sign probably, you've seen it already on, uh, on different products. Uh, it can be on office equipment, it can be on garden tools. Uh, so you see design all over. But we will, of course, it is mainly or for us important is uh, uh, that it is possible to get design for furniture. Next slide. Yes, uh, it is not necessary to have it. It is voluntary, but manufacturers can, they can have their product certified. Uh, if it is uh, certified the product meets the quality and safety standards of the German Product Safety Act, which is quite important uh, if you supply furniture to uh, workspaces, for instance, or for big companies, uh, the offices. Uh, this quality mark, if you once uh, have, it, have your product certified, this is valid for five years after reception. And what goes with it is an annual inspection of the production plan. So it's so there are inspectors with, uh, who come to the company and uh, do some inspection on the product and on the uh, production site. Um, of course, it goes together with uh, uh, also with the first test mainly according to standards with some additional features, uh, some addition, let's say you, you test the chair with uh, 
uh, security uh, or you do durability of a chair uh, which according to the standard is maybe 20,000 cycles and then for the GS mark you might need 40,000 cycles. So this is something which is a bit on top on, of the normal standard. Next slide. If we have a look on the golden M, this is a test regulation. It is called RAL GZ430. Uh, uh, it is a, a regulation or is a quality label of the German furniture industry. And apparently it is uh, the only recognized quality mark for an entire piece of furniture. Of course, you can also have quality marks for the material, materials which are used in furniture, but this is uh, uh, especially for uh, a complete furniture. And here we call about upholstery furniture, kitchen storage, children's uh, 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 furniture, and also bathroom. So it's quite a wide range. And uh, also here, we have uh, additional uh, requirements uh, on top of uh, normal European standard. Next slide, please. So the tests, you need a test uh, in an independent test laboratory, uh, which are recognized by, by RAL and uh, these tests include, for example, durability, stability, uh, color and light fastness, manufacturing quality, and also pollutants. So this is quite a wide range. Uh, and it also goes in not just for security and safety, it is also for uh, uh, health uh, aspects. Next slide. So these are these were two labels and now I'd like to go uh, uh, to a, a sample what we did uh, out from this market surveillance and these are the technical requirements for changing units because it was a follow-up after uh, we heard internationally in Switzerland we heard that there are some problems with this uh, furniture uh, so the surveillance uh, uh, organization uh, bought different products on the market. So let's have a look on these changing units for domestic use. Next slide, please. So the uh, the surveillance, uh, uh, the entitled surveillance. Uh, uh, organization bought eight changing units in different jobs. You see them on the right hand side. Uh, they were all different, all with the same uh, aim uh, for babies to change babies and to have also some uh, spare material in stock with these drawers and, and uh, drawers on the bottom and open shelves. So the, uh, we as accredited laboratory carried out the tests on all eight uh, changing units. The standard is this EN 12221. Uh, you see it only in uh, the, this German or the Swiss, uh, the, the Swiss uh, standard on the right. But however, the number uh, you see uh, so the tests were done according to this uh, standard. Next slide. So there are two parts of this standard and also what was it also in, uh, included uh, was this EN71, safety of toys, because a part of of these uh, changing units were uh, had to be tested according to this uh, EN 71 part one. Next slide. So here the overview of the test procedures. Um, 
So it was first there were the measurements of the changing area, then measurements of gaps, holes, and openings, then of course movable parts, uh, parts which were detachable if there are rollers and wheels, uh, screws, then these extendable parts which are they are very important and then structural stability, strength, and uh, uh, also these protective margins. And at the end, also the packing, uh, the packaging is also an important issue on, on furniture uh, for children. Next slide, please. I will go through a couple of uh, 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 tests, but of course, not all of them. So here, the, the furniture, uh, what you see here is exactly the one uh, from IKEA. Uh, here you see what the functions of this uh, furniture and also what uh, is necessary according to the instructions of the supplier. So, next slide, please. So, here you see just a sample. Uh, on the left, you see the picture. Uh, from the, 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 the test standard. And on the right, you see how we carried out this test. This is usually not a big problem, but uh, as I mentioned before, with this bunk bed, there are these, these measures. You just have to fulfill these measures. And it is, uh, if you have the standard, you also know the height of these uh, side parts. Uh, to fulfill uh, these requirements according to the standard. Next slide, please. Then here you see uh, various test equipment. Uh, you see this, this on the left, this uh, measuring tapers, finger type sensors, children's head, this is on the top right. Uh, they are defined by the, uh, by the standard. But it's quite interesting how to use it. And it's not that easy to know how to use them. Next slide, please. Here you see these uh, things in use. Uh, on the left, the finger. And on the right, you see the head. So this head must not be uh, uh, somehow get uh, stuck. and due to the possibility of strangulation. So this you see, here you see how that works. Uh, it's not a big deal to, to know how, uh, how to do this uh, test or especially how to fulfill the requirements if you know uh, how it is tested. Next slide, please. Here you see how that works with the stability. So you, the, the furniture is uh, folded out. So it's really the change in unit and now it shouldn't tip over. And uh, once it could tip over uh, in, in one direction or in the other direction, this has to be tested like this. And all these measures where to apply the, the forces or the weights, uh, it is in the standard. You see on, on top this uh, cylinder part, this is actually the weight of the baby. And then you see on the right, uh, this hanging weight, and this is also defined by the standard. And uh, if this weight is applied exactly in this position, uh, which is defined by the standard, uh, it should tip over. So here you see, apparently there was no problem uh this furniture didn't uh, tip over so next slide that was the strength uh also defined in the uh, standard you put on in this case 50 kilograms uh on the whole surface and then you also open the drawers also put in uh some weight on the drawers and uh this you leave for a period of one hour and uh, then you look if there are any damages or if something falls down. 
fairly easy, not really a big deal. Next slide, please. So this protective edges, it's quite an important uh, issue on this changing tables. And here, this is how it is uh, defined in the standards. Uh, you have to incline the surface at an angle of 15 degrees uh, out of the horizontal uh, surface. And then you have a test body of 15 kilograms, which is supposed to be the baby. Uh, it has to be aligned and uh, it should roll down. And then this protective edge shouldn't uh, fall off or it should really uh, hold back the baby. This is actually the intention of this test. It's quite uh, interesting. So we go to the next slide. And here we have um, two possibilities. So I would like to ask uh, for the first video. You see, this is actually a simple test. Uh, you just go like this and have a look if, if it, uh, anything falls off. If you go to the right, uh, the right picture, we do here the same and you see, it falls off. So this uh, furniture on the right didn't fulfill uh, the requirements. Now, of course, if you know the standard, it is uh, really easy, even during the development of the furniture, to make this test yourself and to see if this uh, could, this furniture can, can fulfill the, the standard. For this, it is not necessary to go to a uh, a test center or to a laboratory, because this test, in a in a first glance, you can you can just start, and uh, in, within the development of the furniture, if if it is possible to fulfill the the standard. So next slide, please. Another issue which is quite important is the packaging. Uh, in some standards, the packaging is quite uh, uh, clearly defined. For instance, uh, the thickness of the uh, foil, of the plastic foil, and uh, this can also be measured. But uh, of course, uh, uh, this is a small issue, but uh, you have to know it even you uh, develop a furniture uh, or sell a furniture and you pack it, it should be the right foil, because this is also tested at the laboratory. And so I, I, if I remember well, there were one or two of this furniture out of these eight, uh, which were wrongly packed. And uh, another thing is the labeling. Also, the labeling is quite clearly defined uh, in the uh, in the standard. Here you see it. It One of the major uh, issues is that it has to be printed in all official languages of the country in which the changing unit uh, or the changing furniture is sold. And this is something which uh, applies actually to all furniture, uh, this instruction. Sometimes in the standard is even uh, written what you have to write on this instruction or even on the furniture. So the, all these warnings, uh, they have to be uh, supplied with the furniture. And uh, this is also uh, tested by, uh, according to this EN standard. In most of the EN standards, for especially for children, uh, this is uh, included in the requirements. And here, once maybe this labeling, uh, it needs permanent labeling of the, uh, in this case, for this uh, changing unit, uh, it must be uh, written from whom it is, uh, the trademark, it, as I mentioned, this uh, warning, 
and also uh, what has to be uh, written on the label is the number and year of issue of this European standard. It should be written on the on the furniture. So this is actually uh, sorry. Uh, uh, next slide, please. I mentioned this already with this labeling. Sorry, with this instruction. Uh, I leave you to read it. What I mentioned before. This is really in the standard. Uh, uh, it's a requirement of the standard. And uh, next slide, please. Also this one, uh, this label, what you have to put on the furniture somewhere. It's defined in the standard what you have to write on the furniture. So we are through for this part. Uh, from my side, are there any questions? Because the next is uh, uh, we go on after the break, I think. So if there are any questions, I'm open to questions. Це одна з найцікавіших частин, особливо особисто для мене подивитися, яким чином відбувається випробовування. It's one of the most interesting parts for me within the presentation. I love seeing how tests are conducted in labs. When I was listening to the presentation, I realized that labs or test centers are assuming new roles, some unexpected roles. Not only do they serve as test centers for compliance with the standards, but as you can see, they can also cooperate with designers for developing and designing new types of products. I think it's very interesting and exciting. What are some of the thoughts that came to your mind when you were listening to this presentation? Are there any questions or comments? We still have two blocks or two major topics ahead of us. And these topics will be a little bit different. We will talk about uh, product fitness for purpose. And the last block will be dedicated to furniture trends. We will talk about smart furniture in particular. So you have a great opportunity to ask questions or clarify certain issues pertaining to standards and regulations. I, There's silence. Yes, I, I, will, I would like to add, uh, add uh, uh, something, what you mentioned, Radmila, uh, the development of furniture. Uh, it is really very interesting for the company to involve a test center uh, in the development. We also experienced this, that uh, someone who is uh, designing a new chair, they come to the test center, not to test the whole furniture uh, with all these issues uh, uh, in the test standard, but uh, they come just maybe to test the stability or the durability in first place to choose the right materials, to choose the right uh, uh, timber, the right connections or, or the welding points, if there is a chair, for instance, if there is a chair, metal chair. And just to be sure that they are developing in the right direction. And it happens that uh, the design of the chair is changed just to uh, uh, to fulfill the requirements of a standard. But if you do that, if the chair is already uh, ready for sale, it is very costly to change the design. So if, if the, uh, a certain part of the, the tests are already done during development, it helps a lot to save, uh, to save costs, which maybe later come up. 
so I really I encourage all the uh, the companies who develop furniture to get involved with the test lab uh, as early as possible. Um. You made a very good point there uh, because we have uh, uh, several test labs and test centers represented here. Could you share your experience? Do you have experience of uh, working with furniture designers, not only furniture manufacturers? I yes. want to revert back to what Pablo mentioned at the very outset of our webinar. The purpose of the UNIDO project is to support quality infrastructure, and we want to support and equip labs to be able to test wooden windows and furniture, in particular children's furniture, because the issue of uh, children's furniture safety is on top of everyone's agenda. Nonetheless, as per our assessment and assessment of UNIDO, we don't really have demand for such services. So we don't really see good cooperation between test labs and furniture designers. And to the best of our knowledge, those labs that test furniture based on various standards, including EN standards, do not exist in Ukraine. Manufacturers resort to some out of the box and creative measures. Sometimes suppliers or buyers test products in Ukraine and beyond. So this is the current state of affairs in Ukraine. But you as manufacturers should be ready for changes. As per UNIDO, furniture is one of the sectors in Ukraine where export exceeds import. Maybe I'm wrong in someone from the Furniture Manufacturers Association will correct me. If you are here, then let me know whether I was right by saying that, or maybe I'm just ahead of the card, as they say. I cannot see any phrased hints. Well, this issue is still outstanding. It's hanging in the air. We really hope that our today's webinar will be helpful, that it will help you accumulate additional knowledge. Hopefully, you will have better awareness of the importance of certification and accreditation, because uh, failed products can have some really severe consequences uh, for uh, manufacturers, uh, um, importers, uh, distributors, uh, and designers. We would love to hear your experience. If there are any questions, please use this unique opportunity. You can either ask questions or you can share your experience. Good afternoon, greetings. On behalf of the Ukrainian Association of Furniture Manufacturers, I would like to add something. My name is Oksana Donska. I am a board member of the Ukrainian Association of Furniture Manufacturers, and I'm also a CEO of the exhibition founded by the association. Uh, furniture of Ukraine um, export business. In June this year, we staged this exhibition for the first time. And the main purpose was to ramp up um, furniture exports. And we've been quite successful. During 10 months of 2021, we increased 
furniture exports by 49% in comparison with the same period of 2020. And 88% of this export includes um, exports to EU markets. On the one hand, it means that we have multiple experienced exporters in Ukraine. On the other hand, it also means that they know how to document and uh, prepare uh, their products in the right way. But uh, there's one sore issue that we have. Sometimes we cannot freely meet the demand of international buyers. They want to purchase furniture. The existing exporters with experience do not really have any free capacities, and some new actors on the market don't know how to put together appropriate documentation. They don't really have the right certification, and some of them are even afraid of exporting. Just one recent case that we contributed to, products were exported to Bulgaria for the purpose of uh, re-export and for the purpose uh, of re-export from Bulgaria, there was a need to, to get some product certificates. Uh, this is something that had to be done even before the initial export. And the costs implied were uh, 3,800. And uh, the value of the products was uh, 10,000. So basically, these products just uh, came back to Ukraine. So I want to address those furniture manufacturers who have some experience or, of exporting or who are planning to export. Uh, please um, build your capacities, learn more about product certification and accreditation, and do export because your products are much needed um, in Europe and on other markets. Uh, thank you, Oksana. Um, thank you for this um, illustrative example. But another example came to my mind. There's another certification, um, FSC um, certification. I'm pretty much sure that you are familiar with it. This is certification of uh, forest areas and um, wooden products. When we started talking about FSC in the early 2000s, everyone said, we don't really need that, it's too expensive, we're not going to do that. But then the first clients, the first buyers emerged. And there was a need to export such products. In Transcarpathian region, uh, several forestry enterprises consolidated their efforts and they underwent group certification. Then the situation started evolving more and more forestry enterprises started exporting. And right now in Ukraine, I think that uh, um, over half the forest areas uh, have been certified. So my point is, if there's no demand, there will be no interest because it's quite costly and people will focus only on the domestic market. But the situation is quite volatile. We're talking about a market that is developing rapidly and exponentially. The quality design and culture of production are a far cry from what they were in the past. If we can help you in any way, if we can provide you with required information, we will be more than happy to do that. So that was just a short emotionally charged speech on my part. Um, I would like to add one more point related to FSC. Almost uh, every large buyer from Europe 
when they approach us to find new suppliers, mention the FSC certification. There are manufacturing companies that are ready to become suppliers. They have sufficient materials, they have sufficient production capacities, but they do not have the FSC certification. At this point, they try to find uh, intermediaries on the market, but of course that has an impact on the final price uh, for the buyer. And as a result, their prices are not competitive. Um, getting such a certificate is a good investment. So um, do get certified. You can even join forces and uh, um, receive group certificates because that will definitely help you down the road. I fully agree. I have the following suggestion. Maybe we can continue our discussion just for a while and then we will have a short break because our interpreter um, needs a welcome respite and you might need some time to respond to some emails or receive some calls. Then we will hear from Mr. Andriy Litvin. He will tell us about the tools of support that their office can provide. And then we will have more from URSS. There are some other interesting topics that he planned. In particular, he will be talking about trends in the furniture sector. Are there any other questions or comments on the previous blocks? Just a minute, let me have a look at the chat. Uh, Radmila, I would like to add something. Our workshops also intend to enhance relations between different stakeholders and market actors. We are happy that technical experts are also present here, in particular, Ms. Oksana Sak. You wrote that you are a manager of the International Technical Standardization Committee, ISO TC 218, Timber. The topic of our workshop today is directly related to the work that you do. Do you have any practical tips or advice on how we can improve the situation on the furniture market? You can just unmute yourself and start speaking. Is Ms. Oksana Sak here? Ms. Oksana Sak, are you here? Well, maybe she's away from her computer right now. If she is back after the break, then we will give the floor to her. Now we're going to have a break of 20 minutes. You can either leave our meeting or you can stay here. We will continue in 20 minutes at 1 p.m. sharp, Kyiv time. And we will need about half an hour, maybe a little bit more to um, finish off the remaining topics. So thank you very much and see you back here in 20 minutes at 1 p.m. give time. It's already 1 p.m. Dear participants, welcome at the second part of our webinar dedicated to furniture requirements, requirements for quality, safety, certification, standardization, some of the trade barriers that you should be aware of as Ukrainian exporters. In the first part, we focused on children's furniture because there are stringent requirements 
for children's furniture. We also discussed several case studies of non-compliance with the standards and the implications for suppliers or importers. You heard extensively about basic standards that regulate the export of furniture into the EU. We mentioned the European General Product Safety Directive. We placed emphasis on technical requirements for changing units, in particular in Germany. And you were able to see how those changing units were tested in labs. And now we are ready to commence the second part of our webinar. And now I want to give the floor to our guest. I'm pleased to welcome Mr. Andre Litvin, Deputy Director of the Entrepreneurship and Expert Promotion Office in Ukraine. I need to exercise a lot of focus to pronounce the title of your office because it changes from time to time. And to the best of my knowledge, your office expects some other changes in the near future. So you will provide us with some news updates and useful tips for exporters. Did I get it right? Exactly. All right, uh, let me begin then. I'm delighted to welcome uh, everyone. It's true indeed that the title of our office changes from time to time. Let me provide you with a short overview of our institution, and I will also update you on the recent changes and development. Our institution was founded uh, as an expert promotion office, and in 2016, 2017, we were an advisory body to the Ministry of Economic Development. In 2018, we received the status uh, of a state-owned or public institution. Now we receive our funding from the state budget. In 2020, our institution was transferred to an even higher level. And now our office operates at the Cabinet of Ministers of Ukraine. So basically, we are one of the structural units of the government of Ukraine. And in May this year, the powers of our office uh, were expanded. And apart from uh, export promotion, we are also responsible for entrepreneurial uh, promotion. So we provide support for SMEs. Um, you can see the website of uh, our office. Um, EPPO means um, Entrepreneurship and uh, Export Promotion Office. On this website, you will find details about our institution, case studies, and you will also find information about other similar institutions in other countries globally. What can we offer? Um, opportunities for entrepreneurs, uh, services and uh, for exporters, um, analytics and information, um, export consultancy, um, education for exporters, opportunities for exporters. Uh, we co closely cooperate with the Ministry of uh, Digital in uh, Transformation. Uh, we will service the DIA portal um, and uh, there, we provide upwards of 800 consultations for entrepreneurs, and we will cooperate with some other institutions and centers that support small and medium entrepreneurship. Uh, we are still analyzing and developing uh, some of our entrepreneurial services. As for our um, expert promotion component, um, it's um, live and kicking. Uh, we are in the continuous process of refining and upgrading our range of services. A couple of words about the intended uh, structure of our office. A lot will depend on the funding that uh, we will get next year. In uh, 2020, our funding was reduced because of COVID-19, but we still exceeded our KPIs. And in 2020, we demonstrated that Ukrainian companies sign 
contracts uh, amounting to um, $49 million. A little bit further in my presentation, I will tell you more about our export promotion services and some other activities that we conduct domestically. What can we offer in terms of export promotion? We um, offer education for exporters, uh, um, export consulting, uh, partner search, analytics, and research. Um, more details about um, each service. Education for exporters, it includes a wide array of programs, um, ad hoc events, a wide variety of courses, uh, um, and manuals uh, for companies. Um, this service targets those companies that don't have any experience of exporting um, and those companies that have some experience of exporting but they are not really systematic or regular exporters so uh, this unit is responsible for designing all sorts of training courses and programs uh, we conduct um, educational uh, webinars uh, um, uh, for example uh, when the uh, free zone um, equipment uh, agreement was signed with israel we invited some representatives from israel and they um, elucidated what that was uh, how um, it would work etc the educational unit also elaborates uh, uh, large scale and uh, long term um, courses in september we launched four courses for it uh, servicing companies uh, and um, export managers uh, in particular expert managers of uh, those institutions that want to um, export such training courses last for about eight to nine months and within these courses um, international speakers um, act as mentors and trainers and most of these trainers are practitioners and all these training courses take place in English because we believe that each exporter has to have at least one English speaking representative in their team and ideally they should have an English speaking uh, expert uh, manager um, these courses are great i participated in one last year sometimes you have to stay up and do your homework until four o'clock in the morning but you get exposed to the best global experience uh, some of the things that are um, deeply rooted in the global markets are not even available in ukraine yet um, on um, our website you you can find some manuals, you can find some recommended courses, and we offer multiple other opportunities for entrepreneurs and um, exporters. Um, you can find all this info on the export web portal. In December last year, we launched this export portal, and it um, accumulates export related information from various sources. This is the information that had been accumulated uh, by our experts for about a year. Um, you will find info there on uh, regulatory mechanisms, uh, various uh, um, contexts of public institutions. You just need to visit that web portal and spend about three to four days. Um, it uh, both uh, um, copious uh, materials. Uh, we um, analyze about 48 sources of information on a daily basis. So all the information is reviewed and updated on a regular basis. Consulting um, is another big component of the work that we do. Uh, the first uh, bullet point that you can see is uh, uh, export fitness test. Um, you can order all our services via the export web portal. And that means that you need to sign up there. Um, you can sign up either as an employer of a company or um, you can also sign up as a legal entity as a company. The problem is uh, that uh, um, companies suffer from the fluctuation of expert managers. So it's not always a good idea to sign up your expert managers because if there is a new person, we have to go back to the drawing board. So we encourage companies to sign up and then we invite the relevant representatives of these companies. And through our CRM, we can track down all the services provided, the feedback received. And the first thing 
uh, that uh, a company does um, is a, a, an expert to fitness test. You answer some questions and then your employer received some advice on what should be changed, what can be improved, what is missing, and then our consultant contacts this company and offers specific services. Because if a company tells us that they want to export to the US, but we can see that they don't have an English language website, they don't really have any English speaking staff members, then of course they will not be able to export to any country, let alone the US. Um, it's an extremely important aspect and it's a prerequisite for getting our services. We also offer guides that include useful information uh, put together by our experts. These guides uh, contain simple language information on uh, um, how you can do research, um, how you can receive required information. Through these guides, you will have a better understanding of how to get ready for export. And we also um, offer um, international um, public procurement GPA. Um, in uh, May 2016, um, Ukraine joined the government procurement agreement, uh, GPA. We have a separate consultant uh, in this focus area. The next component of our work, uh, research and um, analytical unit, it's a very interesting division of our office. I think that it's most needed. Our office has access to international databases that small and medium enterprises cannot freely access. Euro monitor costs $50,000, and most of our companies cannot freely afford it. And we have access to these databases, so we can glean information from there and provide it to companies and entrepreneurs. Usually, groups of companies and associations uh, contact uh, this unit. Uh, for example, uh, there's a group of companies in a specific sector that want to access specific markets. They want to export, uh, export to those uh, markets. Uh, they can uh, send a request to us. We have a group call with these companies. We interview them. We explore their needs. And then we analyze the markets they are interested in. We um, analyze trade barriers, um, competitors, uh, trends, and we provide these companies with a formal report uh, and we make a presentation. And then we provide them with advice on where it's better for them to export if they don't want to waste the time um, or money. Um, export um, is um, a long-term game. Therefore, the right choice uh, of a country can help you save uh, a hefty amount. Our analytical unit um, also designs uh, guides that uh, contains useful information uh, while exploring external markets. And we also provide services for alliances, uh, like choosing a market for export, um, external market review. Um, and we also help with requirements uh, on the EU uh, uh, markets. So all this information can be received from our unit. This unit also perpetually um, updates information on uh, upwards of 40 countries that are included on our web portal. And this unit also updates um, any prior research in different areas. And there's another service that is much needed, uh, the uh, search of partners. Um, most companies that contact us are interested in finding partners abroad. How can we do that uh, considering the pandemic? Um, a lot of face-to-face -face events um, have been canceled. Um, of course, it's a challenging process, uh, but now we can observe a completely different uh, trend. Uh, over 90% of people in the B2B segment look for clients online. Uh, they use a wide variety of tools and sources. Uh, they use online exhibitions, online events, and they uh, visit uh, 
over 10 resources to find at least one partner of one client. Um, Enterprise Europe Network is a tool that has been very helpful since the onset of the pandemic when the borders were closed. Um, it's a, a network, it's a program uh, financed by the European Commission. We are a member of the consortium of this network in Ukraine. Um, over 68 um, members, uh, upwards of uh, um, 60,000 entrepreneurs. So it's like a basic networking or matchmaking. A Ukrainian company can create uh, their own profile in the English language um, in this uh, um, network. And uh, the representatives of any countries can uh, express their interest in this Ukrainian company. And if the Ukrainian company fits the criteria, they can have direct uh, negotiations. You can also participate in online exhibitions and events in different sectors from different countries. And we already have some success stories when Ukrainian companies were able to find partners and clients uh, via this Enterprise Europe network. So I would like to encourage everyone to create your profile in this network and review um, relevant uh, and up-to-date um, offers uh, from time to time and participate in online exhibitions and events because if you um, are idle if you do not do anything then nothing will happen the government cannot do it for you so there has to be initiative and proactiveness uh, from entrepreneurs and uh, companies our task is to create a platform for meetings and the task of uh, Ukraine and companies is to sell their services and products. Unfortunately, uh, this is something that Ukrainian companies are grappling with. The companies don't really know how to sell themselves and their products. Currently, the cost of products is not the key aspect. Uh, there's another word that I really like, value. It's a much broader concept. You have to meet some broader needs of your potential client. So do not just sell by saying we can offer the lowest price possible. Um, it doesn't really work anymore. Um, there have to be some other um, strengths that come into play. There has to be a differentiation point, uh, maybe the history um, of your company, or you need to have a specific story uh, behind. Um, there are a lot of European companies that are very good at storytelling. They position themselves as family businesses and they use storytelling to sell and sell their services. But if you sit down and do your math, logistics, uh, tax, uh, and some other associate costs, the um, final value will not be uh, the highest yeah, because uh, uh, some companies come and say uh, we have the lowest prices so, so we will be successful but if you do proper math you realize that it's not the lowest price so if you have a look at the end cost uh, for clients um, it's higher than the competitive price so my point is that you need to be very meticulous about your calculations and to this end we have an analytical unit and they can review uh, the products and prices of your competitors but education is key as i have already mentioned education is the foundation for expert activity if you are not educated if you're not trained you will not succeed we can do uh, surveys uh, among exporters on an annual basis we have the same exporting countries the us canada great britain canada uh, some other developed countries. So for some reason, Ukrainian companies want to export there because they think uh, that they will receive more money for their products, or like Scandinavian countries. But it doesn't really work there because competition is tight there. And if you want to enter those markets, uh, you need to excel. You need to differentiate yourself uh, from other market actors. What else can I say about searching for partners? In uh, September this year, uh, we launched the international uh, version of our web portal because before that we had only the Ukrainian version. And on the international uh, web portal, we accumulated English language information about um, Ukraine, because if you just uh, Google info on Ukraine, you will find some outdated information of uh, three or four years ago. Um, we are struggling with analytics in Ukraine. Uh, we collected info from associations, 
uh, we also involved some donor organizations that uh, conducted studies in various sectors. There you can also find uh, information on bilateral relations. And uh, there's also a catalog of Ukrainian exporters there. A Ukrainian company can sign up on this web portal. They can create their English language profile. They can upload photos of their products, uh, but it's important to upload high quality photos, not just from your cell phone. So upload um, superb um, high quality products uh, that will um, stimulate um, potential clients uh, to buy. You can also upload any certificates that you hold. And when a potential buyer from abroad looks for um, suppliers in Ukraine, they usually contact us uh, because uh, we can uh, check um, companies uh, in Ukrainian registers and databases. We have a direct uh, contacts and we can also facilitate negotiations at an initial stage. Um, on this web portal, um, international buyers can also sign up if they are interested in a specific Ukrainian company, they forward their request to us and then um, our consultant contacts the relevant Ukrainian company and facilitates the negotiations. Uh, this year, uh, about seven contracts uh, were signed via the web portal, even though the final version or the public version of the web portal was launched only in September this year. There are two more tools that are not reflected in the slides, trade missions and international exhibitions. When we had more funding before the pandemic in 2019, for the first time ever, we co-funded the participation of Ukrainian companies in international exhibitions. And it was a big upside. We believe that the government should financially support Ukrainian companies in participating in exhibitions because usually the fees are quite high. I believe that the government has to support Ukrainian companies in um, taking their products uh, to um, global markets. And we also uh, organize uh, trade missions. Uh, for example, uh, we can uh, put together a dozen of uh, companies. We organize meetings uh, and uh, um, there's an official delegation, an official business forum. And then we also have some individual meetings. The standard is to have at least four individual meetings with those companies that already know you. Uh, the single export web portal, I have already mentioned it. So everything that you have heard from me can be found there. So I want to encourage you to visit this web portal and find more details there. All these services are provided for free. What are the eligibility criteria? Uh, as a company, you just have to fill out a form. There are certain criteria that you have to comply with. And if uh, you comply with those criteria, you are eligible. So all the services are detailed on the web portal. Uh, Briefly, on our entrepreneurship uh, promotion component, this is the DIA business portal. The purpose of this portal, per, portal is to help um, entrepreneurs and businesses uh, develop, but um, that information uh, targets domestic users, uh, small and medium um, enterprises. You can find um, up to 70 various services there. There's uh, another service that uh, uh, is financially supported uh, by the USAID uh, project. It's also supported by the Ministry of Digital Transformation. Um, we offer consultations. We want to offer these consultations to about 50 Ukrainian companies. The On Frontier uh, platform includes uh, upwards of 5,000 consultants from various sectors. So a Ukrainian company can fill out a form and briefly describe their problem. Like for example, they want to upgrade their operations or maybe they want to change their trajectory of development. 
or uh, maybe they want to implement some internal changes in their company. So these are the cases uh, that uh, you can submit. Um, you need to be fluent in English and a Ukrainian company can receive uh, three free consultations with international consultants. And the market price of such a consultation is about uh, 3000 um, USD. Uh, the organizers will provide you with my PowerPoint presentation. I will also provide you with a link via which you can order this service. Uh, on this slide, you can see our priority sectors for this year. Uh, we will review the list next year. In one week, we will launch a survey among exporters and based on the findings, we will decide on what to do next year. There's a question in the chat on whether we are planning to financially support participation in international exhibitions in 2022. We included this cost item um, into our budget, but unfortunately we don't have a final say in the budget approval, even if we do not receive any funds from the state. Fortunately, there are some international donor financed projects um, this year and last year, they provided financial support for Ukrainian companies to participate in international exhibitions. So I don't think that it will be an issue next year. That's it on my part, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, when I was listening to your presentation, I had this feeling that uh, I was present at a banquet because you presented uh, such a multitude of uh, different opportunities and services. Uh, I have a question. The focus today is on furniture, and you mentioned that it's one of your uh, top priority sectors. Where should I go? And what kind of information can I find as a furniture manufacturer? A technical regulations, standards, certification, what kind of information is available on your web portal? Do you have sector specific information to start with? So where do I start if I am a furniture manufacturer? If you sign up on our web portal, you can contact specific units directly. There are some info emails and you will receive a reply within a short period of time. And there are also unit specific email addresses. For example, if you have an analytics related request, you can forward it to the relevant email address. We have a country specific info and analytics. If you are interested in regulatory um, barriers and tariffs, you can use a different email address. So my point is that you can use different pathways, but in the end, you will find the needed information. The portal is designed in a way to help you find the information that you need in whatever way. If that information is not available or if you have not been able to find information you need, you can contact us and we will put together a customized package of materials for you. Um, of course, uh, not everything is available on the web portal. Sometimes we need to contact uh, some of our counterparts or specialized bodies abroad. So we can always find the, the necessary information, but um, it just um, needs a little bit more time. If you cannot find any information on the web portal, uh, just uh, use our general email address. Um, all the contacts, all the email addresses can be found on the web portal. So if you cannot find the information that you need, just um, submit a request and uh, we will help you. We receive requests via email. Uh, we receive requests uh, via Facebook Messenger. Our staff members uh, forward all requests to the relevant unit. So you should be able to receive a reply within the shortest time possible. Well, thank you very much. I will definitely explore the export web portal, but this export web portal and the DIA business portal are two separate things. Exactly. The 
expert web portal is one thing and the DEA business portal is a different thing. These are two separate focus areas, so we decided to separate them. But on Facebook, it's a little bit different. We have our office Facebook page. It looks like a typical official page of any other governmental agency. You will find generic info there about our purpose structure team. And um, on the DEA business portal, you will find details on what we can offer to businesses and entrepreneurs, uh, both the exporters and non-exporters. Um, I will provide you with more materials that you can disseminate among the participants. I've run out of questions. Are there any other questions to Andre from the other participants? While you are formulating your questions, I would like to remind you that once we are done with Andre, we will continue our presentation with URS, and URS will elucidate the current trends in the furniture sector. Export web portal and the DIA business portal. Any questions on that? I have already visited the web portal briefly. Um, there is a ton of uh, educational and training programs there, both short-term and longer-term ones. So thank you very much for joining and thank you very much for providing this rich information. Urs, are you back here? Yes, I am. Because there are no <coughs> questions right now, so we can continue with your presentation. So let me have your presentation back on the screen. This is where we stopped. Product fitness for purpose and trends in the furniture sector. Yes, thank you very much. Um, it's a bit... Uh, uh, heavy title, but I think uh, we rather go for the trends for, uh, in the furniture industry. Uh, I'd like to go through some interesting developments, uh, giving some ideas, uh, but I'd like to remind you that it is not the full range. There are probably some other trends, some other developments, uh, which are interesting, which I uh, will not uh, point out. I think uh, if you see uh, this first picture, I think this is one of uh, uh, very interesting uh, development in, in the recent years actually becoming more important with the importance of the internet uh, during pandemic. Uh, it's, it's really something uh, very interesting. Uh, customized furniture. So uh, you see on the right hand side, uh, they're all furniture made from the same pieces, same from the, uh, made from the same parts, just a bit different colors. Uh, but for instance, the drawers, the inside is all the same, just uh, uh, the size changes. So they have a, a size. Uh, some certain sizes, and if you combine these, uh, you get all these different uh, variations of furniture. Um, I think the interesting thing on it is uh, it is made to order. So uh, you go to the shop uh, or you go to the internet uh, and you combine what you would like to have, and then uh, you place the order and it is delivered exactly what you ordered. And it is, especially it is also produced exactly what uh, is ordered. Uh, the, maybe the disadvantage is that it takes a bit more time. Here in this sample, uh, it's a Swiss retailer. Uh, it takes them about uh, six weeks, six to eight weeks to deliver after play, uh, having placed the order. So not big quantity of the same furniture. It is rather uh, uh, 
personalized uh, furniture and uh, all look a bit different. Next slide, please. Uh, here you see a bit uh, uh, further into this uh, configurator. Uh, you see you can choose only from six colors and uh, but on the internet or on the computer in the shop uh, you just uh, choose the colors on the furniture part you would like to. On the right hand side you see the furniture uh, elements. Uh, so you have uh, elements with uh, small doors, with two doors, with one door, you have uh, drawer elements, uh, you have open shelf elements, uh, you have uh, uh, possibility to choose the legs or the handles. Uh, so that's quite a bit of variety and you get immediately a price for it. So I think this is a trend which will really uh, uh, come up more and more. And at the end, it is also for the furniture manufacturer quite a bit uh, different than just producing a couple of thousand uh, pieces from uh, of the same furniture. So it's an opportunity, but you need the platform. And this is probably something which is not that easy to get. Uh, yes. So this is a first sample with this customized furniture. I think this is really a trend. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, another trend what we uh, noticed is these lightweight panels. This is not really new. You see on the right hand side with uh, uh, made from uh, strong paper or on the left hand side it's a bit more uh, developed uh, uh, panels made from wood particles. But in the middle, you see, you also see the possibilities you have uh, with the wiring, for instance, in the furniture. But uh, there is also, a, a, of course, a slight problem. Next slide, please. Uh, you need actually new technologies for the fittings and etching because uh, light also means, or lightweight also means that you don't have much material to uh, for the positioning of the fittings or for the screws. So you need new technologies which are in progress, which are already developed or in progress to be developed. Uh, but of course, uh, lightweight has a big advantage uh, if, if you also combine it, for instance, with, uh, with this personalized uh, furniture, uh, you, it's not necessary to have a heavy transport vehicle to, to transport all these goods. Next slide, please. Then, of course, virtual reality. Um, it can be a tool for product engineering, as you see on the picture, for prototyping. But I think for the mo at the moment, it is also very important for the sales. Uh, because people, it's sometimes it's difficult to imagine how your furniture looks like or uh, how your the, the effect of a furniture in your uh, own room uh, will be. So I think here is quite a bit of potential, and the technologies here of the virtual reality, the, this these tools are actually here. Um, but I think there's quite a bit to go still that uh, it will work also in the shops. Uh, the shops need the equipment, it needs the software, it needs uh, all this uh, technology for uh, uh, with, with the computer and this, uh, yes, and the software, as I mentioned. So this is a sample. Uh, I think also for product engineering, for sales, it's actually clear. Uh, it's for the customer, it's a real advantage for the customer, uh, but I think it is also interesting for the prototyping, for instance, because uh, it's then 
not just the drawing or even the 3D, three-dimensional drawing, uh, it is also uh, a possibility to, to get the, the product really fit for use. Next slide. Then uh, another interesting trend uh, is this augmented reality. I just tried out myself recently something. You take a picture of your room, uh, you place the furniture from the shop and you know exactly how it looks like. It can be done for the flooring, for instance, it's uh, uh, quite common already if you use a wooden floor parquet uh, that works quite nice. Even this parquet goes under your furniture and you see exactly uh, how it looks like uh, in your room. And of course, as in, in these pictures, uh, it's visible. You place the furniture in your room. Uh, it's, it's really very, very interesting to get uh, uh, an idea how it will look like with your furniture. This is something for the sales, but I think uh, as a furniture company, producing company, it's also necessary to have all the data of your furniture that and all these uh, 3D uh, drawings uh, that uh, it is possible to uh, include it in, in this kind of apps. Next slide, please. <laughs> then maybe something which is a bit more in future, but uh, already possible. Uh, we have a research project that uh, uh, BF at the Bern University of Applied Science, where we try to uh, get uh, a wireless power line in the panel. That means you it you are free to uh, place uh, the the illumination somewhere in the furniture. You see on the right hand side, the that these were the first uh, ideas how it could look like. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and here are some first prototypes. So you see these LED uh, lights. Uh, there is no wire to this LED. It's just uh, the, the, the current is going through the, the, the panel itself. So it needs a new panel. So this is one of uh, development, one of a research project to get a panel like this. But as you can see, it is not that far away from reality. Uh, it's probably also a, a matter of cost for this panel. Next slide, please. This is something also very interesting. Uh, we've seen this already in kitchen furniture and kitchen tabletops uh, where you have a, a, some kind of touch screen where you can get the weather. Uh, and here, this is something where this is already included in a table. But I think the interesting thing on it is that if it is switched off, you have a wooden table, just a wooden table, nothing else. And uh, then you switch it on and uh, you can use it as a screen, as a touch screen. Uh, I'd like, it is a link to YouTube and uh, I hope it works. Uh, if you may click on the video, uh, you might see it. Can I ask you to click the video? Yes. Uh uh, just a minute, I will have to stop sharing my screen because the video is on, but you cannot see it. Now it's on.
Oh, thank you very much. Let me have the presentation back on the screen. Uh, I, to me, it, it, it took very interesting. And what is really interesting, they produce, they uh, announced, or, or they say they produce 100 pieces as a limited edition and uh, still probably a niche. But uh, this can be a trend or this can be a possibility to get an added value to the furniture. Of course, it is not the cheap furniture. It's not for everyone, maybe at least at the moment. But uh, it inspires probably to, to develop uh, some furniture uh, a bit further. Next slide, please. Uh, again, these lightweight uh, panels, uh, we have a research project uh, also on the lightweight panels. And sometimes with these foams, this is already possible. You get panels with foam in the middle, but the problem with the foam is it's not uh, biodegradable. And uh, here we are on the research for a bio-based foam system and uh, also in the production, it is uh, the idea that it is, uh, the production is in combination with the particle wood. So it's not the separate particle wood and you put the foam between uh, the production line uh, is meant to be, uh, you produce the particle wood together with the foam part. The idea is to get a competitive uh, particle board, uh, to get a competitive board uh, uh, in, in comparison with particle and fiber boards. And of course, the mechanical properties, uh, what you have at the particle boards nowadays, they should also be uh, reached again with uh, the new product. Next slide, please. One of the uh, big, big trends nowadays is this 3D printing. Uh, of course, in certain areas, it's quite uh, established and common. I think in 3D printing for furniture, uh, for full furniture is of course still in development, but for furniture parts, it's already uh, a bit established, or at least you can have it uh, on a, on an industrial basis already. You see on the right hand side uh, where the, the 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 corner joints or the joints uh, between legs and the, the rest of the chair uh, is made from a 3D printed uh, plastic part. Uh, on the left, you see this chair or even uh, this uh, soft chair. Uh, it looks quite uh, design. Not everyone will like it, but I think uh, this 3D printing will come up uh, in furniture, uh, furniture manufacturing as well. And I mean, a couple of years ago, it was uh, a very, very expensive technology and only few companies, uh, specialists, uh, specialized companies had the possibility to do 3D printing. Nowadays, we have already 3D printers at home and uh, step towards uh, high-end products uh, for furniture, I think is not that far. And maybe a last uh, development this is already uh, this is maybe a little bit further uh, of course this 3d printing uh, the material which is used is maybe not uh, the best for the environment and uh, there are now research projects or uh, developments towards biodegradable plastic granulates, which are possible to be used for this uh, 3D printing. Uh, this you also see on the slides, you see the uh, websites 
they have quite a few uh, interesting uh, interesting possibilities or interesting samples where they used uh, uh, these materials already. So this is actually just a quick overview. Uh, I don't want to get too much in detail. There are quite a lot of other developments, of course. Uh, you know them also. Uh, I think it's just maybe something a bit more unusual. It's, it's really also a look into, into the uh, closer or further future. So thank you very much. Uh, and I don't know if it's still uh, uh, time for questions and discussions. I give over back to Radmila. Thank you. I have two questions, one for Urs and one for the participants. I'm not familiar with similar examples in Ukraine. Maybe the participants know which interesting developments we have in the area of uh, smart furniture, 3D printing, uh, lightweight materials or lightweight components, in particular biodegradable components. Has Ukraine stepped on this pathway of circular economy yet? So this is a question for the participants. And uh, I also have a question for Urs. Considering these new developments and innovations, what about the standards and certifications? Will they try and adapt to these new developments and innovations? Will they change? Or we will still use the same standards for furniture? Because the functional properties or the physical and mechanical properties remain intact. What do you think? What should we expect in the future in terms of certification and standards? Well, standards and certification always develops. It, sometimes it takes a bit long until the standard is adapted to new technologies, uh, especially if we talk uh, about technologies which develop fast, the standards are always, always quite a bit behind. Uh, I think in terms of safety, uh, it's clear it, it, the standards will stay, maybe they have to be adapted. Uh, and there might be new standards. There also might be some standards uh, uh, which are not uh, necessary to have anymore because uh, it's not, they do not adapt to, to the, these technologies which are in use. But I think the, the main thing is on uh, in terms of safety, uh, the standards have to be adapted because, especially in furniture, if you see furniture, the last slide, this is a chair. And if you have a look on the standard, what, how they see the chair and how it has to be tested is quite a, a big challenge for the test institute, for instance, to find the right procedure for a new chair like this. Uh, there's always, how to how to apply a, a force for the tipping over, for instance. So the standard has to be developed in, in, in any case. And then maybe as soon as we are talking about new materials, uh, there's also the 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 the, 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 the problem or, or the issue of, of uh, health health to the people who are using it uh, or also the, the environmental circle or the circle material circle from uh, the production down to the uh, uh, disposal. Uh, if, if, if we talk about cradle to cradle, for instance, this is quite a big issue, which will be probably more important in future how it will be uh, uh, in, in terms of standards, I don't know exactly, but, but there will be uh, standards developed in, in any case. Thank you, 
Urs. Well, a chair is not really a seat in four legs anymore. I mean, um, your imagination is your limit. If you are aware of uh, some similar developments or trends in Ukraine, uh, please uh, um, speak out or share it in the chat. I scanned the presentation during the break, and I remembered that there is another interesting thing that I can share with you. It's a bonus for whoever stayed with us until the very end. I mentioned at the beginning of our webinar that uh, there are several online courses for furniture manufacturers, uh, for students, uh, for uh, vocational schools, but we also have some training courses for um, higher educational institutions. So the bonus for you is a compilation of links. These are the links that I remembered. Some of these courses are available not only in English, English but also in Polish. Um, EQ Wood. It's an innovation management course in the furniture sector. It is comprised of five blocks, five units and it targets higher educational institutions and uh, innovation managers. It elucidates such issues as how to conceive an idea and how to translate it in reality. So you can see a unit on design thinking, conception and prototyping. There is a unit on innovation management and uh, there's also a unit on project management. The next course is DTRAMA. It's Digital Transformation Manager for the furniture sector. So once again, this course targets specifically furniture manufacturers. This training course comprises some video clips and case studies that can help you be on top of the digital technologies that you can leverage in the furniture sector. Fern 360, a circular economy in the furniture sector. This training course includes a lot of interesting cases from real companies. There are some other train courses, but I have not had enough time to find the links like Sunrise. It's a game for furniture company employees. So you join a furniture company and you start as an apprentice. So the first thing you do is you sweep the floor. Then you are given special exercises designed within this course and then you become an apprentice, uh, then you are responsible for logistics. So you basically, within this game, uh, grow and uh, get promoted uh, up the career ladder. Just, it's a course that targets uh, bionic enterprises. Bionic means synergy of the technical and creative. Smart Train 3D, Print and Smart Furniture. And within this course, you will find plenty of information on one of the recent trends. The furniture has to be adapted to children and elderly people. For example, uh, sensors are integrated into cribs, and the same is true um, about beds for the elderly. There's one project, I don't really remember its title. Um, that's it for now. I don't want to keep you here any longer. I don't really have any other info for you. Are there any questions, comments, additions?
we would love to hear from you. We would love to hear from the manufacturers present here. Um, hello again. Fern 360. Is it a program? Um, is it a course or like Sunrise? Can you repeat that? Because uh, there's a lot of information. So these are online courses. Uh, these are ready-made online courses. So they are free. You can just uh, visit one of the websites. You sign up there. And then you can complete this training course at your own pace. You can watch all the training materials, all the video clips. You can do all the relevant exercises and assignments. You can do all of them. You can skip some. Um, if you complete uh, um, all the assignments, you will receive a certificate. I believe that these training courses uh, can be useful in terms of training, but you can also use them uh, to provide internship opportunities uh, for your staff. All the participants will receive all the materials, all the presentations via email, and uh, that will include the links that I've just mentioned. I have one more question. I have a very neat presentation on the recent trends and developments. Several years ago, we uh, brought some new fixtures from Italy uh, for cabinets, but unfortunately, we cannot find them in Ukraine. And we cannot really offer this product for export. because not everyone is interested. We're not really sure where to look for these products. If uh, there's an answer to that, I will be happy to hear. Well, I can see that this topic is uh, romantically mysterious, but it's very practical and hands-on at the same time. I guess we will wrap up. Thank you for being with us until the very end. Let me remind you once again that the UNIDO project focuses on strengthening the quality infrastructure for windows and furniture sectors. This project will be in Ukraine for several more years. Stay tuned, follow our news. We really hope that we will strike good cooperation with test labs in Ukraine. And we will do our best to continue providing you with new and latest information. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to meet all of you. Thank you for your questions. And I really hope that this webinar has been useful and interesting. Enjoy the rest of the day.